Welcome to today's Tech Talk on Analyzing Vibration. I'm Lisa Arrigo with Tech Based Media, your moderator for this program. Our speaker is an expert who has been helping engineers test and analyze shock and vibration environments around the globe. His name is Stephen Hanley, and he is a test engineer with NDAC. In this Tech Talk, he will demonstrate analysis functions available to help engineers obtain actionable data. Audience members may download a PDF of his slides by clicking the link under Event Resources on the screen. And questions may be submitted at any time through the Ask a Question box on the screen. And now, it's my pleasure to welcome Steve Hanley. Thank you, Lisa. I'm excited to be here uh, with all of you to go through this Tech Talk today, where I'll be going through a typical vibration analysis example where I took some real data on an Airbus A320. So it's pretty cool data to go through. Uh, but before I go through that, I'm going to start by giving a little background on the toolbox software that we're highlighting today, as well as Tom Irvine, who was the engineer that, that built out uh, much of that toolbox. And I'll close uh, by, by providing some more resources, because uh, there's a lot of uh, information we're going to be covering today relatively quickly. And so I'll give you some more information for you to dive uh, deeper uh, in your own time to w explore many of these topics. So Tom Irvine uh, has been a vibration shock analysis uh, engineer for many years. He started by working with NAS NASA with their uh, shuttle program to, to provide the uh, shock and vibration testing and analysis for them. And over his years uh, through them, he started sharing his knowledge uh, of vibration and shock analysis with fellow engineers at NASA and then uh, the world at large through his website. And NASA encouraged him to do this to make sure that, you know, many different companies were developing systems that could survive these harsh environments. So his website has a lot of content that's really, really good to go through. We also worked with him recently to compile a lot of that content into a single uh, PDF that, that's on our website uh, for you to download. His other great contribution has been this vibration data toolbox. Uh, this is a MATLAB signal analysis package that he's developed, and he's developed it over 30 years, so it's packed with different analysis functionality. And he has it available on his website. He provides a source code, so engineers out there that have a MATLAB license can download it and, and you know, explore and use it uh, on their own machine. But for those that didn't have a MATLAB license, they weren't able to benefit from all the uh, great functionality this software has. So we recently partnered with him to compile that uh, package into, a, into an executable for those that don't have a MATLAB license. And so that's available to freely download, and we encourage you to do so. Uh, so you can analyze uh, your own uh, test data with, with all the functionality Tom has built out. So now we'll get into uh, this example we're going to run through today. So I put myself in the shoes, or should I say the seat, of a design engineer who was going to be developing a new armrest. I'm updating the electronics uh, and therefore the armrest of a commercial airline. And so I wanted to understand that vibration environment of the commercial, of this armrest. Uh, and then to do so, I need to test uh, what that environment is. So I, I put a sensor where we indi indicated here uh, and, and got the experimental data, and then I'll be going through how to analyze that. There's four major steps uh, of this example, as well as many other uh, use cases where you're doing vibration testing and analysis. The first step is to go get the experimental data. You know, there's a lot of vibration test standards out there, which can provide uh, an overview of what to expect in different environments, but they're always general, and they encourage you to really go get the vibration profile from the specific uh, environment that your system is, is intended to be operated in. So, First step is to get the data, which I'll explain next. Uh, but then once you get the data, the second step is you have to kind of go through that and find an area of interest uh, to develop then a power spectral density. And power spectral densities uh, quantify that vibration environment. So you want to develop this kind of simplified uh, power spectral density to then use in your third step, which is you know, using that power spectral density with the vibration response spectrum uh, to inform your design decisions, to understand what your system you know, should have as a natural frequency and which, that, which natural frequencies it should avoid. Once you've developed this uh, new system by using the power spectral density and vibration response spectrum, 
The fourth and final step is you now want to test your new prototype. And so you want to simulate uh, that operation on that real environment in a laboratory uh, environment. So the first step is to, to get the test data. So here I took a picture of, of an NDAC sensor I put on the seat, uh, like we showed a couple slides ago where it was located. And I was on the aisle seat, so it was a little alarming. Uh, I, was, I was nervous that I was gonna get arrested at one stage when the flight attendants noticed it, the blinking light right there on the, the armrest or the seat. Uh, but I was able to get most of the flight, especially the, including the takeoff and uh, over an hour worth of, of kind of steady state flight. And so what I see a lot of engineers do once they have a ton of data is they proceed to the next step with this, you know, hours of data and calculated power spectrum density on, on this massive uh, data set. So that really is not an advisable thing to do. You should be looking at that larger data set and finding different uh, operational conditions to then generate maybe a couple different power spectral densities. If you generate one power spectral density off the entire environment, you run the risk of, of maybe muting or completely uh, of missing some areas that were pretty harsh that lasted for maybe several minutes, but over the course of many hours uh, kind of gets drowned out. So that's what I did here. I went through the many hours of data and found some, a, a specific area of interest. Once the plane had reached steady state flight, uh, I found you know, 20 seconds of data that was harsh, uh, but also consistent through, through a, a good portion of the flight. And that's what I'm gonna proceed uh, with the next step of, of analyzing that data. So yeah, now the next step is, is taking that vibration data once we've figured out uh, a good area of interest and developing this power spectral density off that. So here we're using Tom's toolbox, uh, the vibration data toolbox that has a really good function to calculate the power spectral density and allows you, the engineer, to specify uh, different processing options, different bin widths uh, to use, which, which I can explain next. What you may see is a lot of people, when they generate a power spectral density, they'll get something that looks like uh, that plot on the left. It's, you know, it's very fine, it has very fine resolution. You have a lot of different breakpoints of the power spectral density, but it really kind of looks like a shaded uh, mess. And by using the toolbox, you can expand the bin width to to find the um, energy in that specific frequency range over a wider frequency range, you know, maybe not just uh, 0.1 hertz, but a half a hertz or even several hertz to, to smooth out the power spectral density while still uh, accurately representing how much energy is in that frequency range. Now you run the risk though of, of maybe muting some different spectral um, resonances in the system. Like you see on the right, you know, once you have a, a bin width of 62 hertz, you've basically completely eliminated uh, some, of those, some of those resonance peaks. So as a design engineer, you need to use your best engineering judgment uh, of what's a good frequency bin width to use that, that can provide a smooth PSD while also not eliminating some uh, very noticeable resonances in the system. So for me, I would probably pick uh, that one that has maybe a, a, that two hertz bin width is probably the best option. So once you've got that power spectral density, you'll, you'll still have uh, many different breakpoints. You know, it's still gonna have many thousands of different points uh, of resolution, which is gonna be too much for many design tools, such as inputting into a shaker system later. The one thing that the toolbox has is this conversion into octave format of the power spectral density, which you see here in the red line, uh, which will actually has a slope uh, that's on an octave uh, scale on a decibel scale to have maybe as little as 10 breakpoints. So that can be small enough to then use uh, in shaker systems and other design tools. Another thing I see a lot of engineers do is they basically just draw over the maximums of the power spectral density, which you see uh, there in green. The problem with doing that is you run the risk of making your environment too harsh and really not representative of the actual one. And so what you need to do is a bit of trial and error, which I've already done, using a vibration response spectrum to find a power spectral density simplified test standard uh, that, that can accurately represent the environment while still being simple. So I did that there in that, that middle black uh, line. 
Now that I have that standard, I'll proceed to using it uh, with the vibration response spectrum to inform my design decisions. But again, steps three and steps two tend to be a little iterative uh, to use that vibration response spectrum off the test standard you developed to see if it, it fits well and it maybe tweak some things. First, many of you probably don't know what a vibration response spectrum is. It takes an input power spectral density and over a range of different natural frequencies of a hypothetical system, it tells you how that system would respond. And so you can use this to then inform different design decisions on where to avoid natural frequencies in your environment. And again, the toolbox has a, a great function built in where it can calculate this power, this vibration response spectrum off of a uh, input power spectral density. And the nice thing about these uh, vibration response spectrums too is that it tells you not just how your environment responds in an acceleration, uh, but also how the velocity and displacement can respond to the power, uh, the, the input vibration environment. And so here are the displacement, pseudo velocity, and acceleration responses uh, to that input power spectral density. And we have those four options there. One is the power spectral density that has many different breakpoints. You know, the one that's kind of generated off the experimental data. And then in red, we have the octave format, which you can see, although it, it looked pretty simple and muted a lot of those different resonances, it, it tracks very nicely uh, to how the, a system would respond in a, uh, from the experimental data. And then those two other test standards we developed, that too harsh of one really is magnifying uh, the response and it's, it's not representative of the environment. And it has a profile that isn't really uh, consistent also with the environment. Whereas that test standard uh, that I already developed kind of uh, through trial and error really tracks nicely the, the power spectrum, uh, the vibration response spectrum of the experimental data while still only having, you know, four or five different breakpoints. And so as a design engineer here, I'm going to be looking at this and saying, okay, I need to avoid uh, a natural frequency of my armrest of 530 hertz because that's going to be magnifying the acceleration levels in the system. But I also really should be avoiding uh, a natural frequency environment of my armrest around seven hertz too, because that's where it can have the most damaging uh, velocity levels, which correlates most directly with fatigue. And so you, you wanna have probably a, a natural frequency of your, of your armrest of either, let's say, you know, 30 hertz or maybe even a, or several thousand hertz. But because of, because of how massive an armrest is and how much mass it has, it's probably most likely you'll be able to hit a natural frequency of around uh, 30 hertz, which would probably be the best bet. So now that I, I have uh, a target of my natural frequency to design for, I'm going to proceed to the next step and develop this uh, system, design it and build it, and now simulate the environment. So the toolbox will ha has a really nice functionality to, to do this time series synthesis. So you put in your power spectral density and it will generate time series acceleration, velocity, and displacement data that can satisfy that power spectral density, which is really nice. And so here is the responding uh, you know, time series synthesis. And you can see now in terms that are really intuitive to understand how the system is responding, how much uh, is it displacing, how quickly is it traveling in velocity and acceleration. And you see compared that acceleration synthesis to the test data that we have, it is a little bit more severe but it's not uh, grossly too uh, magnified, you know, maybe about twice as uh, high an amplitude of acceleration levels, which is probably a pretty good uh, safety standard to use. So once you've done that time series synthesis, you've understood what the environment's gonna look like off that power spectral density, you can take this now into a shaker system. And most shaker systems will have a software uh, tool that will let you input a power spectral density and it will basically do what the toolbox just did. It will synthesize an environment that satisfies that power spectral density and shake uh, your, your test article to match that. And so when I was doing this presentation, I was lucky enough to find this picture online from a company called M plus P that make really high-end um, multi-channel data acquisition systems and testing systems. So I thought that was kind of funny though that they had uh, the perfect thing that I was running through uh, in my example. And so just to recap, you know, there's four major steps. Uh, first is to get that test data and not just 
proceed to the next step once you have hours of vibration data, but to really look at that vibration data and find the areas of interest uh, to, to narrow in in that are more representative of the environment and maybe find two or three different uh, operating conditions. And you generate that power spectral density, proceed then to using that power spectral density to inform your design decisions using a vibration response spectrum. And finally, you build the system and, and test it and simulate that environment. So just in closing, I went through a lot of material today uh, in pretty quick uh, order. And so there's a blog that we published that, that goes through a little bit deeper uh, on exactly what I just covered here in this webinar. And it also includes a second example in parallel of, of a vibration environment uh, in a Ford F-150 to compare it to uh, the Airbus A320. We also published recently two blogs, one on power spectral densities and one on vibration response spectrums to dive a little deeper into why they are so helpful uh, and how to use them. And of course, the Vibration Data Toolbox, the software that we just went through is free, and you can use that. Uh, we also provided the data that I went through on this webinar for you to analyze, but that toolbox uh, can you be used on any data set. But it's helpful to maybe you know, follow along with, with the data I used here. And then Tom's handbook too, really gives the fundamental information uh, of what's going on in all these different analysis steps. And here, this link, ndac.com slash toolbox, provides uh, a nice, simple uh, page to give you all these different resources in one spot. But we're here. If you have any questions, you know, our customer success team, our engineers like myself, are here to answer any questions you have on our sensors or our software or just vibration testing in general. Uh, and we really look forward to connecting with you and on any questions you have now or in the future on any other webinars. So with that, I'll hand it back uh, to Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was a great presentation. This Tech Talk will be archived on our website for the next 12 months. Thanks for watching.